good evening everyone welcome to this uh, nxp campus connect program and uh, thank you uh, hod sir uh, uh, professor dr sandeep singh solanki ji we have long association with uh, bitmasra mm, yeah. we you know always visiting uh, your campus and hiring uh, students in big numbers and uh, your students are doing you know wonders in nxp hope i am audible yeah thank you perfect perfect sir so uh, you know uh, during you know covid time we created uh, this digital uh, platform where basically the idea of nxp leadership team is create a bridge you know between the academy and the industry so that uh, we can share uh, vlsi related and the system engineering related uh, innovations with the students so that students will get benefited with this uh, uh, association with this platform so just a brief intro of you know nxp campus connect program you know uh, we are conducting almost now 3 years and uh, 50 plus sessions uh, already delivered all the sessions are you know we are recording it and we created a uh, youtube channel where all these videos are recorded and maybe i will share all the links with you sir and please share this with students and the professors with you know so that these all guys will be you know benefited with this uh, recorded uh, sessions on every first tuesday of the month uh, we are sharing information or new technologies related to the vlsi topics and on third Hi. tuesday on third tuesday every month we are you know sharing a topic related to the system engineering the topics are already you know fixed for this year the time is also fixed which is you know uh, on first and third tuesday every month we are going to start the session sharp at 5 around 5 and we are going to close uh, by 6:30 uh, followed by uh, the q and a and all so this is the brief introduction of this session and uh, once again uh, thank you uh, sir for providing this opportunity as well as the platform so few words from your side uh, uh, hod sir thank you <coughs> uh, as you mentioned that our association is very long i also remember and recall that those days okay and uh, i will just introduce few more things about you okay uh, our student must uh, i think uh, may not be aware that uh, you have established a lab in our department and that time this nxp was free scale and we created a lab named embedded system design lab and you provided uh, many kits for our students to do the experiments and uh, very soon we are going to revive with the newest technologies and the newest hardware and uh, also you have uh, committed to me that you will be providing the hands on training during those sessions okay uh, and already <coughs> i nominated a person from my department of the priyank saxena i hope that you are getting full support from him okay uh, the last thing that i want to say is that my student should take maximum benefit of these sessions which is going to come in future also thank you very much Manish, once again, to you and your team that you have taken this effort for our connections once again. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, sir. Yes, uh, I committed you that you know we are going to upgrade the lab, and yeah. uh, maybe we can start more interaction with uh, the college as you already suggested that you are going to allocate one professor. Maybe we'll create a WhatsApp channel where we can you know provide you the support as soon as possible. Plus. you know uh, we can plan some training for professors or maybe uh, some you know guys who are managing the labs yes uh, will you know increase uh, this association uh, in near future uh, hitesh garg is our you know uh, india country head and we have a very solid uh, nxp india leadership team and we are very committed you know to support college to take it to the next level yeah. okay and one more thing that i will share you with our syllabus part Okay, Perfect. and uh, in that we will be taking the feedback from your end for its upgradation. Sure. Uh, also, I tell you that uh, our VLSI team 
at uh, the EC department is now a very good strength and uh, you can anytime visit to our website and can yeah. see the profiles of uh, the entities. They are doing really very, very good work into their field. Okay. And a lot of research we are having right now and uh, many hardware are also getting included. Recently, we have uh, proposed a FIS project. In that, uh, we have got around two crores from uh, DSP for establishing a lab for the fabrication of sensors. Okay, basically, that is going to be on uh, the platform of uh, the, the VLSI only. Okay, mm -hmm. so maybe that time uh, I'll uh, call you during the inauguration time. Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you. Perfect, sir. Sure, we'll extend, uh, you know, support and uh, we'll interact on that topics. Uh, yeah, without, you know, uh, investing much time, uh, I request, uh, may I request all the presenters, please enable your cameras. So uh, just a brief introduction on our presenters. We have three experts visible on the screen. Uh, Parul Sharma, who is our, you know, uh, experts from the analog design side and having 20 plus years of industry experience. His, you know, expertise, uh, uh, you know, in the field of uh, Sardesk, power management designs and 5G solutions. We have Ankit. We have Ankit visible on the screen. Uh, he is our front end design uh, manager, expert from the front, front end design of SOC. His expertise mainly, you know, from the automotive uh, processing. He is our expert from the automotive applications. And he's having 12 plus years of industry experience where, you know, safety critical systems, associate design, architecture, clocking, safety. So he is, you know, uh, going to share his experience uh, from these areas. And Sapna also is visible on the screen. Uh, she is our, you know, principal design engineer. Again, uh, uh, the uh, NXP, you know, local are a lot of experts from the automotive uh, associate design, IP design and all. She is our experts from the SOC micro architecture, uh, uh, from clock, reset, you know, different debug domains. These are the critical uh, part of the SOC design. So without, you know, investing much time, uh, you know, I'm handing over to uh, Parul. And Parul, please uh, start the presentations. Yeah, hello, everyone. I am Parul Kumar Sharma. I am analog design, and I'm giving over to Ankit to carry this presentation. Thank you, Parul. Uh, thanks, Manish, for the introduction. And I am very excited to be uh, present uh, to be presenting this session uh, along with uh, Safna and Paul uh, in front of uh, this vast audience. Uh, so the uh, agenda of this uh, session is uh, an introduction of uh, SOC architecture. So we, we will begin with that, and then uh, I will be taking on uh, clocking architecture, uh, where uh, we will discuss uh, the various kinds of clocks using SOC, uh, how they are connected, and uh, their way. Uh, their usage and the uh, their usage in the architecture and what are the different kind of clock domain crossings how to take care of them in the design then sapna will take you through the reset management uh, where she will discuss uh, uh, why reset is needed in the design uh, the reset controllers on the soc and then uh, various aspects of uh, reset architecture and uh, uh, the reset point crossings on soc and finally, uh, Parul will take you through uh, the analog design part of uh, clocks and resets. Uh, he will discuss about uh, uh, phase lock loops uh, and uh, the concepts of uh, level shifters, voltage scaling, as well as uh, he will discuss a couple of NXP patents that we have in these areas. Uh, so moving on. Uh, uh, so this is the basic. Uh, a very basic and very primitive SOC. So first of all, what is SOC? Uh, SOC is system on chip. We also call it SOC. Uh, and, uh, the, the diagram that you see right now is a very, uh, very primitive uh, uh, SOC. Uh, currently, the, uh, the SOC which are available in market, they are much more complicated, very complex designs. Uh, we all have learned about uh, uh, microcontrollers and microprocessors in our classes right so microprocessor is nothing but uh, just give me a second
let me enable the pointer. Pointer. Move all down. Issue with uh, just give me a second. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So we have uh, already learned about microcontrollers, microprocessors in our classes. Uh, so microprocessor is nothing but a, a core which is depicted here, and it will have its. Uh, 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 some register banks, uh, arithmetic and logic units, uh, or, and uh, uh, some control logic inside it. Right? Then we moved on to microcontrollers, which will have a microprocessor in it, uh, which will be kind of very basic uh, one, along with some peripherals, uh, some memories, uh, and some very basic peripherals like timers and uh, uh, some interfaces. Maybe, right? So those. Uh, and then when we graduate from microcontroller, then uh, we will have uh, a SOC. A SOC in has a lot of logic which we uh, use in a board design. So it will have cores, it will have its own memories, or it will also support some off-chip memories, and then uh, it will support a lot of peripherals. So if, if we can look here at this basic, uh, uh, SOC architecture. It will. It has two cores. This cores can be in lockstep also uh, to support SLD operation. Uh, some cores have their own interrupt controller, or we may need to connect some other external interrupt controller to this cores. Uh, we might have EDMA on the SOC. It will support uh, uh, the offloading of cores some, for some basic data transfer tasks. Uh, it will have multiple clocks. On the SOC, which we will talk shortly on, uh, in the next slide. Then we might have some uh, uh, security controller. Not all SOC will have security controller, but some SOC would support us uh, on chip security controller. We might have uh, some other form of uh, other masters also, right? Uh, so Ethernet controller or HTSC controllers. So there are various, uh, depending upon the application, it might vary. On the south side of this crossbar, we will have some these uh, on chip RAMs. Sometimes even NVM is there on chip uh, non volatile memories. And it would also support uh, some form of off chip memories, uh, maybe off chip uh, RAM, uh, DDR memories, or NVM. And it will control to a host of uh, peripherals available on the uh, chip. So here are some example of those peripherals, but of course, these are just very basic sample. It will depend upon the application. So, and this uh, crossbar that we have mentioned here, uh, nowadays uh, you will see all these crossbars are basically AMBA based uh, crossbars. So, either they are AXI or uh, AHB uh, protocol based, and this peripherals, they are APB protocols. So, these are now, this is a very basic standard uh, SOC architecture, uh, but the question remains is uh, why SOC is needed at all? Uh, why we cannot uh, do everything using discrete components? So first of all, uh, the reason is reliability. So we, we can connect all these components uh, together on a board, but will that be reliable? There will be, uh, uh, if, if uh, it comes packaged as a SOC, it will be available to us uh, in a tested form. Uh, we can directly use it uh, without worrying about how all these components are connected or if we are able to meet all the uh, aspects of this connectivity. But when we are connecting on uh, a board, it will uh, have some soldering issues. Somewhere we will find uh, some uh, other issues. This, uh, this connectivity will be very unreliable compared to a SOC uh, design. Performance is another critical aspect. We will uh, The performance of a SOC is vastly better compared to connecting discrete components. So, for example, if you uh, look at this course, they operate it. Uh, uh, they can operate at excess of one gigahertz. Many of these peripherals operate at uh, uh, hundreds of megahertz. But uh, the uh, pins, uh, the external pins, uh, which if you have a discrete component, they do not support such uh, large frequencies. So this interf we are limited by this interface. 
and when uh, we have everything uh, in a small chip then we can easily meet all the timings and uh, we can uh, improve performance significantly compared to uh, having the, these components in discrete form the third one is cost so the cost can be uh, different kinds of costs right so one can be bomb cost so if we buy all these components uh, separately and assemble them uh, the net cost will be much larger compared to buying a single sock then board size uh, this entire thing can be uh, fitted in a thumb size chip but it will not be possible if we do the same uh, with discrete components and the most important factor is power dissipation when you have all these things separately, uh, all of them have their own IOs. They will be uh, tremendous leakage from IOs. IOs consume a lot of power. Then uh, there will be a lot of metallic layers, metallic connections between them, and we will uh, lose a lot of uh, power by uh, this I square R. Uh, but the, the same thing will not be there uh, when we uh, use a SOC design. So now uh, moving on uh, i'll move i'll move back to the uh, sock clocking architecture so the first question that uh, might come to our mind is why clock is needed in a design at all uh, we can design some basic digital circuits as we all have done using purely combinational logic but it is not scalable solution. So for example, if I am assigned to do a task, uh, I have been given one task, I can do it and I'm done. But if uh, I'm asked to do say 10 tasks, if I have 10 versions of me, they can do those tasks parallelly. Otherwise, what I am going to ask is, okay, tell me which task to do first and which task to do second and so on. So we, I need some kind of sequence in which I need to perform those tasks. So that same sequencing is done using clocks in a sock design. So we have sequential elements like flip flops and latches, and they all work on clocks without which they will not be able to understand which task to do when. Then on a single SOC, you might see uh, multiple uh, varieties of clocks being used. So one of them, uh, is uh, a crystal clock so a sock might uh, consume a crystal clock input a crystal uh, input from a crystal oscillator uh, it is very precise and stable uh, clock uh, and most of the protocols will require this clock to be present otherwise they will uh, not be able to function properly and the second clock we have in many SOCs, which is uh, rc clock rc clock is uh, built using uh, resistor and uh, capacitors and with temperature, these values vary, and also with uh, process corners. So this clock, these clocks are very uh, low accuracy clocks, and uh, they are generally required from the safety perspective on, in some of the socks, so that you have always one clock available in case something happens to the external crystal. The third one is PLL clock. So PLL clock is generated using crystal clocks. Uh, they are very high frequency clock. In general, uh, the interfaces, sock interfaces do not support those high frequencies. So we feed uh, this uh, crystal clocks to, uh, as input and then PLL can uh, generate high frequency clock using that crystal. Uh, the another one which I have listed here is real time clock. So in our SOCs, we might have multiple modes. Uh, one of them can be standby mode. Uh, we always need some kind of timekeeping, right? So even though our car is turned off, uh, but still in the background, it is managing the time. We know when we turn on the car, it tells me the exact time. What what is uh, what is it right now? Instead of having to set it again, so that means there is one clock running in the background. So we we can uh, enable this PLL clock as a background clock, but it will consume a lot of power. So generally for this purpose, uh, a, gen a separate real-time clock is present uh, in many SOCs. Uh, so now we will be moving to clocking architecture. <laughs> so uh, in any SOC, uh, uh, we need to look into, uh, we need to define the clocking architecture and it will involve a lot of uh, 
things, uh, one of which is clock multiplexing. Uh, there will be clock division, there will be clock uh, domain crossings. So all of these are part of clocking architecture and how to take care of that uh, varies from uh, SOC to SOC. Uh, now talking about clock multiplexing, uh, uh, the primary reason we need clock multiplexing is that uh, most of the time we do not want uh, our systems to use a single clock. There might be various performance modes in our SOC, right? So if uh, my uh, uh, system is in standby, so for example, in our phones, we might have a standby mode or uh, in some of our electronics, we do have standby mode. So we do not want a very high frequency clock to be consumed because it will consume more power. So we will switch back to some uh, very slow clock. Or we might have multiple uh, various levels of performance in a SOC. So for that, we have some kind of clock multiplexing in the design. So in a very simplistic form, we can have two clocks and uh, they can be multiplex based on some uh, multiplex logic and the output can be fed to sequential elements. But this is not a very good design practice as we can see on the form here. Uh, uh, so this is clock one, this is uh, second one is clock two and the third and at this point of time, if you see here, uh, we are switching the clocks. And because these two clocks are not synchronous, we see a glitch in the final clock generated. And this glitch will then propagate and cause a lot of trouble in uh, our rest of the design, which we obviously want to avoid. So for that, uh, uh, we can uh, take uh, advantage of glitchless clock multiplexing. So in this, this is a basic circuit of a glitchless uh, clock multiplexing. Here, this select logic, this is our MUX. <coughs> Much structure. So this select line do not directly impact uh, the output clock. Instead, it is first synchronized in the this clock domain, and then it will impact uh, the output clock. And the impact will be present only when this clock is stopped. So this feedback is also present from the second clock domain. The synchronizers I will cover in subsequent slide. What is synchronizer and why it is needed? Uh, And then we can move to clock gating. Clock gating is another very important topic uh, in clocking architecture. Uh, we do not want every logic to be clogged all the time. Because, uh, even though the logic is uh, not, the output is not changing, there will always be some leakage current associated with it and some dynamic current associated with it. Uh, and uh, we want to reduce the power consumption. This is specifically very uh, important in case of uh, uh, all the portable instruments. Right? So even if our car is there, it is uh, when we turn off the key, still it is in standby mode. It is not completely turned off. So the, it is consuming the battery uh, that is present in the car. And if uh, it is uh, battery, if it car is not turned on for quite long time, it can eventually drain off all the complete battery. Right? So we want to reduce this power standby power uh, consumption or even during the run mode, we want to uh, reduce the power consumption. So overall, uh, our SOC is within the power budget. This is achieved by clock gating. In simple form, you can just gate this clock uh, by an AND gate with some enable logic. But here again, we can see that if we do so, we can have a truncated clock or even a clock glitch at output. Uh, so generally uh, in SOCs, uh, we have a very advanced and so sophisticated clock gating. So one of the very simple example is uh, a latch based clock gating. Uh, in this case, we gate the clock only when the clock is inactive. So here, even though enable Even though enable comes uh, in when the clock is active, this enable is not utilized. It will be getting the clock only when clock is low. And hence the output clock that will get will be uh, without any uh, glitch or without any truncation.
uh, another thing is uh, which is very important is clock dividers so what we do we have some kind of pll clock but the entire circuit is not going to run on the same clock uh, we there might there are some part of the logic which uh, for which performance is uh, required so they might be running at very highest frequency clock for example cores but there might be some peripherals like ethernet which requires say, only 125 megahertz uh, uh, when we are talking about uh, rgmi uh, there are uh, some peripherals like flex can uh, uh, can where you need uh, say uh, even lower frequencies so in in those cases uh, we do not provide the uh, highest clock which is available to us instead we divide it down so we there are multiple strategies by which uh, clock can be divided so i have just covered two of them here one is a very 3 percent clock divider and this, uh, we just count the ages and uh, we on the basis of that so if uh, you can see that there is a divider counter so on the basis of that counter we can generate an output clock so when the counter is 0 and 1 it will generate a high pulse and when it is uh, 2 and 3 it will generate a low pulse so effectively at the output we have a div by 4 clock this clock is uh, a 50 percent clock divider is uh, specifically needed when we have uh, logic which is working on both uh, uh, active uh, positive edge as well as negative edges so that uh, we have a 50 percent duty cycle and we get a complete timing uh, a full uh, uh, maximum timing path in uh, both the uh, high and low cases other uh, very simple uh, clock divider uh, uh, logic is punch through divider in this uh, an enable this is basically an enable based divider an enable signal is used to enable uh, certain part and then uh, the pulses are disabled and again when the second enable logic second enable pulse arrives then we get another output pulse from the uh, clock divider so in, this is also dividing the clock by four uh, similar to above but here on duty cycle is different so we see a duty cycle of only 25 percent in this case this is okay for normal cases but uh, this is not okay if we want to have uh, if we have a negative edge uh, flops in the design uh, then uh, the last topic which i want to cover is uh, clock domain crossing in any design uh, we will have uh, in all the modern SOCs, we will have multiple clocks uh, within the saw so for example i just talked about ethernet it might it is working it needs a protocol clock of 125 megahertz but its register clock might be different uh, quite different and our core is working at uh, even higher frequencies so somewhere when the data is being transferred data or control signals are being transferred from one clock domain to another clock domain we might see some issue in the design so here we see a very simple uh, uh, two system uh, saw so system x is working on x clock and system y is working on uh, y clock so whenever so on x clock out x clock output uh, it is changing at this point of time when y clock is also changing so if this change in x clock output is within setup hold window of y clock then it might introduce some meta stability in the design and this meta stability is very harmful uh, it will propagate to the rest of the design and it can cause unpredictable results so generally this meta stability is measured in terms of mtvf which is mean time between failure and for automotive designs uh, our MTBF should be at least 10 years. So that's why we need to very carefully control it. Uh, this uh, on the right hand side, uh, this figure explains uh, uh, the meta bit stability MTBF calculation. So it depends on uh, the frequency of uh, uh, input, how fast the data is toggling, the destination frequency, and and it depends upon uh, a meta stability constant which is a 
tau which is a uh, property of uh, flops which are being used uh, so the aim in a clock domain crossing is to uh, keep mtpf within our control so there are various strategies uh, where we can take uh, handle this clock domain crossing uh, so one of uh, the simplest uh, way we can handle cdc or clock domain crossing is uh, using uh, synchronizers in this case we have used a uh, two stage synchronizer so two stage synchronizers are basically two flops connected back to back and they are on the destination clock frequency depending upon mtbs calculation and the technology being used uh, and the frequency of operation this might be more than two flops it can be three flops or even four flops how to resolve metastability so the flops that see they settle the metastability uh, very quickly compared to ordinary flops so in this case if we assume that data is changing at this point of time uh, and at the destination which falls in the destination clock uh, setup hold window then the output will become metastable but because this flop uh, the output of this flop the first flop becomes metastable but this flop is a metastable hardened flop so it will settle the output very quickly so by this point of time so this is a min setting time so this is uh, not a guarantee this is just a calculation it might not settle exactly at this point of time but the expectation is that it will settle before the setup hold window of next flop so by the time uh, the out next flop samples the input it gets a stable input at the deep uh, at the deep uh, input and the output is not metastable so this output from the second flop is then propagated to rest of the design in clock domain 2 so in this way we can avoid metastability uh, another technique uh, so there are two more techniques uh, which uh, i will discuss so there are various uh, advanced circuits for metastability uh, control uh, but i am just uh, going to discuss these two more points uh, Uh, and these are mainly used for uh, cdc of data signals uh, so we use stand alone uh, uh, synchronizers that i discussed in last slide only for uh, control signals but if you want to transfer data which are multi bit signals then we either use handset signaling or we use fifos so in handset signaling we send a data then the system will uh, provide an uh, and then at the same time we provide a request to the system y so once uh, the system y uh, receives the request it will synchronize this request in its own then system x will synchronize this acknowledgement and then it will remove the data or toggle the data so data is always toggled when there is acknowledgement received from system y the second form is uh, fifo in this uh, method uh, data is continuously sent to a uh, fifo uh, on system x clock and system y clock will read the fifo in its on clock domain and then its uh, read and write pointers are synchronized with respect to each uh, domain so that uh, Uh, the source and destination both they both know whether the fifo is full or empty so you can uh, the the main aim of this uh, session is to go through some of the topics uh, which are very critical in sock design and uh, I, i think you you can find a lot of real related to this uh, online uh, and in various papers uh, so i, I hope uh, uh, this uh, session was useful to you from talking perspective Uh, now i hand over uh, the session to sapna who will discuss uh, on the sets so uh, good evening everybody uh, after looking in detail on the heartbeat of the sock which is the clock uh, which ensures it's running and is on track 
uh, we move on to the reset on the SOC. Uh, we are going to cover this section uh, basically in two terms. Uh, one is the system level concepts uh, of uh, reset on SOC, and another are some details on the reset on flop and various details around it. Um, in terms of abstract reset on SOC, uh, we'll move on the famous uh, lines of why reset, uh, what reset, and then how reset happens on the SOC. Okay. Okay, so I was on uh, uh, why reset, right? Uh, so when we say that intuitively when my electronics is not working and I try to power off and power on it, essentially what you're doing is providing a power on reset to your chip. Why a power on reset is because a reset allows a chip to get to a known state from where every input will, would take it to the determined state as done by the designer. So a reset on SOC, why do you need it? to ensure a predictable startup state uh, from where it works as per the design. In general on SOC, if you have any situation because of which uh, there is a hang state of the components on the SOC, for example, a bus interconnect, for example, handshake between two modules, a request has been generated, but the act doesn't come. These kind of situations are called hang scenario, where the requester keeps on waiting for an act. So unless you reset the device, very simplistically I'm explaining it, unless you reset the device, you do not have any other mechanism of telling the requester that this request is not going to receive an act and let's start from the first stage. Some very fatal error conditions in the device uh, where you have an error situation and you want to rerun whatever part of software was running on the design. Uh, some test or debug sequence where when you start the test or debugging a software on your SOC, you want to start from a known state to know what programming you have done and how it is progressing. In terms of what causes reset on why you need reset, what happens when you reset was the first slide. Now it is what uh, signals on SOC do you have as reset? Uh, so the causes of reset, what causes reset on the SOC? There are certain external factors which based on which situations, conditions you would want to reset your device. For example, a power on reset implying the very first stage where you supply power to your device. You want to ensure that your power rails have reached a sufficient supply level and then you lift the reset. This is the most basic reset that you find across electronics. Reset underscore B pin, where you want to give external driver a possibility to generate an asynchronous reset during the execution of SOC. JCOM, if you are aware of the debug architecture on device, the JTAG machine, it has this JCOMP pin reset, which is again an external reset pin for the device. These are the external situations. There are certain internal situations because of which you would want to reset the full chip similar to POR or maybe a portion of your chip uh, which you think has the cause of the reset or is malfunctioning because of which you want to reset it and start from state zero. Watchdog timeouts, as we said, power supply disturbance. If you would have some power monitors uh, on your device and if you detect any slightest supply disturbance because of which you know that your logic would not function as you intended it to be, you might want to reset that portion of the device. Uh, some state machine conditions, uh, safety and security conditions, which are basically heavy in case of automotive devices that we work on. We want to ensure that if because of any cause on the chip, the safety or security is in question, we generally reset that portion of the device to ensure that the functions for safety and security are not compromised. Because uh, there is no single uh, source of reset or causes of reset or impact of reset, uh, multiple input, multiple output and requires that for reset on the device, you have a controller, which is called central reset controller. So as you see on the SOC, uh, the basic first slide of SOC architecture, 
you see various modules on that slide for communication for processing for timers etc uh, those are for the function that you intended of the device to achieve those functions it has to has a central clocking architecture module a clocking a reset controller module so this is an example of a central reset controller wherein we say uh, it receives all the sources of reset uh, why you want to cause a reset external or internal because external are something that you do not want to block at any moment if your power is going down you want to reset the device irrespective of anything but see for example any other internal cause of reset for example a bus getting hang a handshake not getting completed those are not very critical in the sense that they do not hog the complete functionality of the device uh, they may impact a portion of your device so those internal resets as you see here uh, they along with your control from the control registers you want to enable or disable those resets you want to uh, reset smaller portion of the device or larger with those internal causes etc that is what you do with the control register the reset state machine that you see here so essentially in abstract format you just call it a reset but, but uh, when a reset comes to your device and the time it is in an ideal situation for any function to run there are phases happening between that and those phases is what the reset state machine of a central reset controller controls a sample uh, diagram for that would look like this this is one of the socks that you could read the data sheet or uh, rm of on the internet uh, so say this is a basic reset controller state machine diagram that you see here which says power up destructive reset and then you see phase 1 2 3 of the reset state machine this is exactly the reset state machine that we saw here so soc to be uh, able to reach the last stage of this state machine which is ideal uh, for your functional software to run uh, it does goes through these phases as you see in the wave diagram on the right uh, there are certain functions that the chip based on its content would decide what would happen in phase 0 1 2 and 3 so for example in phase 1 the chip waits for the power and clocks to get stabilized because it sees that what is it that i'll do uh, to for me to be able to run the functional software i have to have the stable power and clocks right i have to have my flash reset and initialized so that i can fetch the system configuration for my sock to be able to be in a state which is ideal implying the functional re functional software run state so also as we saw it right, uh, that along with internal and external sources of reset you also have multiple reset signals coming out of the chip because for every cause you do not want to reset the complete chip so um, on one output of this reset controller i might go back only to phase three of this reset state machine implying i think some of the system configurations might have got corrupted that is why my chip is not functioning as desired so let me give a reset which only initiates the phase three of this state machine reloads the system configuration at it, as it shows in the waves and then I rerun my program. Or sometime you, if you think that the cause of your reset is a clock failure, so you want to go back to the phase zero of this state machine and have the power and the clock stabilize. You have an assertion from the power and clock monitors on your device, and only then you want to proceed to reach the ideal state. So this is how a reset controller state machine on your SOC looks like when it has multiple sources and nature of reset inputs and outputs. So this was why, what and how of uh, reset on a SOC in terms of system level. What your digital logic uh, is comprised of is clocks. So certain uh, key terms and definitions on the reset in terms of a clock uh, 
these are very basic you can deep dive as per your interest later so uh, you know a flog structure it, in general whatever flog we first read uh, it always has this uh, reset pin which shows asynchronous active low reset uh, that's the basic flog that we have we call it an asynchronous resettable flog there are flops in which the reset pin instead of being an asynchronous input pin uh, is driven along with the path of the data on the flop which are called synchronous reset in which the assertion and deassertion of reset onto this flop happens along with the clock domain clock edge and then there are non resettable flops uh, this looks counterintuitive that while we say we always want to know the initial state of design or flop so as to know what the output is sometimes uh, in designs of high volume you would have flops which are stages of pipeline or which always have a gating of the output uh, with an enable or valid signal so you don't really bother that what is the output of those flops in the initial cycles or when the output is not sampled Uh, so because non resettable flops are smaller in size and implementation easy with respect to the asynchronous reset synchronous reset parts also you don't have to meet the timing on the reset pin because it doesn't exist so that ways uh, based on the analysis we do end up using non resettable flops in design while we know it wouldn't impact the output some of the static timing checks on the reset so uh, set up and hold time of data on a flop with respect to clock edge that is well known uh, but when you have reset on the device uh, on a flop uh, you know that we are saying that reset would be asynchronous would happen at any point in time but if, for a flop to function correctly you have similar thing as the set up and hold time of data you have similar terminologies for the reset which is the recovery and removal time of the reset so when we say a reset has to get deasserted resets are active low so for example this was my clock signal this is my reset signal that has to get deasserted here so zero was my active uh, value of the reset while flop was within reset now if it has to come out of the reset this has to happen in compliance with the recovery and removal time of that flop for reset so for example this was my reset deassertion now this can happen anywhere right but among the various possibilities for this reset deassertion i want to ensure that for a particular clock edge i deassert my reset signal give enough recovery time to the flop to act suitably in the next clock cycle same is the case for removal that at a clock edge i cannot overlap the reset deassertion with it i have to let some window of time go after a clock edge after which i can assert my deassert my reset so basically this is basic idea is to have all registers to come out of reset in the same clock cycle because if you have flop by flop interacting some flops come out of reset earlier some later or they have a non deterministic value for even one cycle of the design your initial purpose of having a known state to have the next known state and output that gets defeated uh, this says that uh, to come out of reset for every flop on same clock cycle this is a simplistic statement uh, coming back to as we saw out of the reset uh, controller right multiple outputs do come out for example if i call those multiple outputs as a phase 3 reset or a phase 2 reset or for reset implying in phase 3 reset only some portion of the design gets reset while for everything gets reset so in line with as you saw clock domain crossing right that if two clock flops are talking to each other but the clock is different they need some mechanism to understand each other when the one is going to give data the second is going to capture but you see same is the case with resets so for example if i have some portion of design which was having uh, the configurations which i say i want to reset on phase 3 okay but that is feeding to some other logic which is on for reset so you see the reset 1 and reset 2 here right so reset when one does gets asserted goes from 1 to 0 but the second flop which has reset 2 here 
that is still functioning. It is one right now. It is not getting reasserted, implying some portion of your logic wants to be in reset. Other does not. But that cannot work flawlessly. Because the output cone of the flop that is getting reset is feeding to another flop that is still working on your SOC. So uh, when you have a chip which has multiple reset outputs, different phases, etc., and you want to decide what portion of logic gets reset on what phases, etc., the interaction of those portions of the design has to be understood, architected well, and any such issues of reset domain crossing as you see it, they have to be resolved. That's it from my side. Uh, moving on to Arun. Parul. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Parul Kumar Sharma. I am from Analog Design within NXP. So let me take you to the analog part of the story, how the reset and clocks are impacted by analog. Okay. So looking from an analog design perspective, any SOC looks at a very uh, 10,000 mile level. It's like a, it has got IO, which is input output because we are uh, work, uh, interacting with other chips on the PCB board. Inside there are like analog portions as well as digital portions. So the implication of this diagram is that we want to see it at a higher level and then uh, go, go, go down to the analog components one by one that are needed here. OK, so analog components could be data converters, PLLs, transmitter receivers, oscillators, power on resets, whatever we talked. OK, so here this is just a sample SOC block diagram of an NXP SOC, which is an I.MX dual plus SOC. It is available on Internet. I've given the link in this document itself. So if you look at the block diagram, it has a whole lot of component. And here in yellow is the clock and reset component, which has got PLL and all those things that we were talking, crystal oscillator and different kind of 32K oscillators, right? Then if you look at, there are a lot of interfaces, MMC interfaces, keypad is there, Ethernet is there, USB is there, JTAG is there, Bluetooth is there, wireless LAN is there, PCI is there, SATA is there, audio is there. So all these interfaces, they actually evolve independently and then through SOC integration, we put them all together which means they also tend to work at very different voltages individually, and they also tend to work at very different clocks individually, which means you need to have voltage management, clock management, as well as reset management. Even reset requirements could be different to put together in an SOC. And that itself is a big work, actually. So let me just go to next slide in the same vein. So from a system level point of view, if you look at a board level thing, so there would be some timing parameter on the reset uh, that uh, um, Sapna talked about like reset underscore B, which is external reset. So whatever with the external reset, it has to have certain timing so that internal of the SOC, we can be sure that we are actually uh, able to reset the chip. And the other vendor has to meet the timing. If the chip specifications don't meet, you don't work. Apart from this, at an analog level, there is always a requirement to configure the chip pins, like how many, what kilo ohm, whether the chip pin would be pull up or pull down. So pull up and pull down means basically up, when the chip is getting powered up, your input or out, uh, your output pin, whether it will have a pull up resistor, resistance to power supply of what value or pull down resistor, resistance to ground to what value. So these deterministic values ensure that the two components uh, tend to uh, interact properly in a known manner at an electrical level also. OK, so looking at this uh, another diagram, which is NXP application note AN1744. So this is just uh, around the resetting microcontroller during power transitions. It's a special application note. So it has all these components like there's an oscillator amplifier, which has got OSC1 two pins crystal, which generate like precise clock. Then there's a system clock generation. So it might generate a lot of clocks for the system portions. And then power on reset circuit, POR circuit, and reset logic that Sapna talked about. So different SOCs will have different flavors of it. And we are picking up components, various available in the public domain from NXP so that you can just get a flair of it. Have your own recipe in case you need it. Okay. So what happens during a power on sequence? So power on sequence, it looks like this, but actually it could be slightly different from this also. So there is a ramp up of power, then power uh, remains stable. And when you power down, it goes down actually. And during ramp up, there could be wiggle and wobbly power also. So at some point in the waveform two, waveform two, basically we there are some internal signal which is actually ramping up with power, which is the internal power on 
power detector. So when the uh, signal power supply reaches certain decent value, it trips low. So once it trips low, we know that a power supply has reached a different uh, definitive value, which is a good enough to do other processing. And by this time, your oscillator may also come to a good level. After this time, you can start to do some like within phase zero in the slide 17 that she said, some of your sig signal processing, counting the number of cycles, waiting for this, whether clocks are stable or not, or power supply are stable or not. They, these are analog detectors built in, into the supply, like pa power monitor and clock monitor. So this is how it would look like to analog designer, and they have to design for all these situations. Like oscillator might start very differently, actually, from case to case. So in one case, it is an early start. In another case, it's a delayed start. So even after a delayed start, you have to start counting. Okay. So this is again a zoomed view of same thing. So how the waveforms might look at the oscillator level and they start to get converted to the uh, internal PUR clock, which is actually ramping up with the power supply itself. But flip-flops, typically they are not assured to work at this level when the it reaches the VDD main to V run level. After V run level, you start to do things properly and you start to do the good, good processing. Okay. So reset in the basic form, there is a pin which is called reset underscore B reset bar. Typically in your desktop, you will find it as a push button. You just do a push button and it uh, it basically, uh, it generates a pulse. This RC pulse is sensed by the pin in a very like first order implementation and that allows it to generate a transition because assumption is that power supply will become stable earlier. RC delayed circuit will be getting stable later on. You can use that time to do your, have some timing about the system. Okay. Apart from this on your phones also, you can do reset and factory reset and those kind of things. So there are another ways of doing push button operations. So let me just uh, go to next slide. So let, this brings to basically the concept of PLL. As I said, there are multiple interfaces. Let us say some interface would require 5 gigahertz clock. Some interface would require, let us say, 400 megahertz clock or 480 megahertz clock. Some interface would require 1 gigahertz clock. So all this and some of these are uh, requiring really precise clock. So how do you generate a precise high frequency clock? So here comes the role of crystal, which is uh, reference clock. Due to manufacturing and other things, crystal tends to have a frequencies lower than 100 megahertz. So their sweet spot is from 1 megahertz, zero, let us say from kilowatts to 40 megahertz is the kind of sweet spot of crystals. And most of the practical crystals, they are at uh, 24 megahertz, 20 megahertz, and those kind of frequencies. And when we say like precise, it means PPM. So the frequency is uh, accurate up to decimal places. Now, question is to convert this accurate internal frequency into an uh, output frequency into an accurate internal frequency at gigahertz level. So that is where PLL comes. So the feedback loop concept of PLL, it multiplies the input clock, retains the sanity of the timing, and it gives you a very high frequency clock. Not only this, as we say, looked at, there were heterogeneous interfaces. So you can you can do a math at the system level, figure out how many PLLs I need, given because you don't want to have too many input crystals through the uh, chip because it, it's an area and a bomb bill of materials. And also it costs money to buy different components and integrate them on PCB. So the typically people want to have a single clock source precise from external and you can have internal multiple PLL or post-processing of PLL output clocks to get, get the required clocks. So this is how a PLL looks like where you have got a phase frequency detector. It's a standard architecture then charge pump and then there is a loop filter. After loop filter, basically you do voltage to current conversion and current control. This is an XP patent and loop divider. So the, the feedback clock has a frequency which is same as V clock based on the feedback concepts and Output frequency of this is something which is multiplied by the V input clock. So the oscillator of the PLL, it is not the crystal oscillator, but VOSC is the output of the PLL. This could be a very high number. And from that, you can have like least common multiple and do subdivision and get other clocks. That's how it works for the PLL. Okay. Now let me go down to the next slide. So we look at it and there are various interfaces. So here, basically, the heterogeneity of voltage is also come into play. Like DDR's memories, they have their voltages. This is just a typical one of the numbers of 1.35. DDR can be at 1.5, 1.2 also, depending on what level of DDR you're having. Similarly, SOC processors, they work at one, one voltage. And analog portions, they typically need more voltage, although DDR internally is also analog. So most of the analog 
these days they work it works at 1.8 volts so we put our like regulators oscillators pls data converters power on reset ios there is a reason that when a chip is talking to external chips the voltages are fixed by the interface so you just cannot choose arbitrary voltages for the external world so that means you have to follow industry standard power supplies for your internal core you can move around a bit 8.8 can become 0 0.75 0 0.67 0 0.65 based on what your power consumption and performance targets are but external targets cannot change they, they are your fixed interface to the world now within the soc itself you need to talk between these levels so when you have to talk between 0 0.8 volt to 0 0.1.35 volt so there is a level shift or up or level up shift required and when you come back from 1.35 to 0 0.8 volts you need a level shifting down Okay. Similarly, the digital core talks with analog IO, which, which means from 0.8 to 1.8, you have to talk in both directions. Typically, analog IO and DDR would not talk because you can talk to digital logic and digital logic can take care of everything independently. There are independent set of controllers. So you don't need a level shifting between 1.35 and 0.8 volts. But level shifting is very important. The reason it is very important is that like digital design, it is one or zero most of the times. So they don't take static power. Analog circuits, you have got many different permutation combinations of tra uh, transistors. They can have a DC current, static current. And then when uh, chips are powering up, level shifters become very critical, actually. So at that time, you need to ensure that there is no extra current flowing in the design. The design is not stuck at some level that digital logic cannot uh, interpret the outputs of the analog output logic circuits. And also they tend to have a very deterministic behavior like any other digital logic. So for this level shifters come uh, in handy. So level shifters by design is basically they tra uh, transfer signal from one power domain to another power domain by re retaining the characteristics. So what I have so shown here is a very uh, basic vanilla level shifter where you have got a signal on VDD LV domain, which is the, which could be a digital domain at 0.8 volts. You just invert the signal, then you give it to a RAM kind of latch. Basically, you have got two NMOS and cross coupled PMOS. So, what it does is that in the VDD HP domain, the PMOS and MOS structure cross coupled that I have shown. So, this is structure, first of all, it will have high voltage transistors. It will not have transistors that can work at low voltage because low voltage transistors they burn at high voltage, they cannot work. So, we give low voltage signals to high voltage design. By using this cross coupled latch, we are able to have a uh, amplify it very high and have two complementary outputs. Now these two complementary outputs can configure the analog design. So it depends on input what the input is. Suppose you want to have a particular reset state, then you need to put switches which will take reset as input and they would put it to zero value of zero or one at the reset time. So this zero and one can, would be available at the VDD HP domain. Similarly, when you are going down in power supply, let us say you have got a signal in VDD HP domain, you want to bring it to VDD LV. So simplest way is to use a inverter, which is uh, using the high voltage transistors and make it work at low voltage voltage, which means the high voltage input will be first feeding the inverter, which is a HV inverter using high voltage transistors. Then next inverter would be LV inverters. It, 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 it would be having a low voltage transition so that the signal is transitions from high voltage to low voltage. There are variants of this you can study in the literature. This simple will not work. OK, this inverter to inverter. So you need a slightly more. You want to save state your output. So, so you want to ensure that they are not. They have a deterministic value within analog domain when power supplies are collapsing or ramping up independent of what SOC is doing or someone else is giving you inputs or not. So those things you can find in patents and all that publications. So going to next slide, this is one of our like uh, level shifter patents. If you look at the previous slide, level shifter was given as a simple set of cross coupled device. But this one is having a more kind of transistors. So if you look at this design, so in the exhibit 204, uh, these are the two cross coupled PMOS devices. In between, there is a protection circuit which protects. It indicates it is protecting. And lower exhibit 208 are the input devices. So it will have two inputs, VI1 and VI2, which are typically complementary signals. Now, the reason for designing this level shifter is this. Suppose we want to run the logic at analog portion at VDDB supply, but the transistors that are used here, they do not support VDDB. Their operating voltage is less, suppose. 
So what you do, you put transistors in a configuration that around them the voltage drop remains whatever they can tolerate. Extra voltage drops needs to be absorbed by transistors. So we stack the transistors. So what this protection circuit does effectively is basically it will take the divided voltage from power supply, let's say one third and two third for sim simplicity. So, so these two gate voltages VR1 and VR2 will come. So what really happens is that the exhibit 402, which is at the output, so it has got two outputs, VO3 and VO4. Typically, VO3 and VO4 will toggle between high and low, but the high of this would be at VDDB. It could be at VR1 supply. It will go like that. It will not go above VR1 supply. Similarly, this one, VO1 and VO2, you have to look at basically from where it is coming. It is coming from VB. And so VB can go to the highest level, which is basically VR2 minus threshold voltage of NMOS. So you can see in a simplest way, if it is a 1.8 volt solution, so upper solution might work, let us say, from 1.8 to 600 millivolts. The lower solution might work from 0 to 1.2 volts. So those kind of complex waveforms are generated out of this and they go to analog design to cater to the design itself. So level shifter is also very tightly coupled to the circuit it is driving because its transistors and the transistor, uh, the circuit that is receiving the level shifter inputs, they need to um, be aligned. Let's say you're, you have got a PLL. PLL might be working at a VDDB supply. You want to configure the oscillator of the PLL at the startup. So what do you do? The control comes from digital. It has got a uh, at core supply. Through level shifter, it goes to analog. And analog level shifter, it gives a static control to the VCO so that VCO starts from a known state when chip is starting up or it goes to again known state when the power supply is collapsing. That is the purpose of level shifter. To It's basically talking between digital and uh, analog transistors. So I think that is all from our sides. So from my point of view, if I summarize this talk, so we covered SOC architectures in some generic ways. We then uh, talked about the importance of clocking and how to do clocking. What are the things that are required? Cl uh, clock domain crossings, FIFOs, handshake methods. Then we went on to resets. We talked about why different resets are there. Multiple reset phases are there. In each of the resets, you have a flexibility and choice to go from phase one to phase two based on need basis. And they are also distributed across the various portions of the SOC. From there, we went to the third portion, which was like going to analog talking about what is a level shifter, what is the need, what is PLL and clocking, and how the reset looks electrically in terms of data sheets, their timings, so that these are all different things we have taken from different sources around the same theme, so that you can have your own concoction and your own imagination around that. So that is what it is. 